All right, guys, happy Mother's Day. It is so good to be able to bring the word this morning. And I thought I would just share with something a little lighthearted. Um, some of you who have kids in, in school or daycare uh, may come home with a sheet of paper that asks uh, your child questions about yourself and the teacher will write out the response. And I've thought Nora's the past two years have been quite interesting. And so I'm just gonna read a couple of them to you guys, okay? Um, my mom is three years old, okay? My mom is really good at dinner, Okay, I'll take that compliment. Um, My mom's favorite thing to do is play with me. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty true. Um, And then she gets, you know, honest, I guess. My mom is happy when she sits on the couch. (laughs) My mom is not very good at cleaning the house. (laughs) And I just wanna make this clear, this is her teacher's handwriting. And so I think um, our teachers are having a little too much fun with this. Um, They're getting all the tea. I was like, you couldn't have asked for another response and maybe, right? No, it's hilarious. But anyways, um, it's just a lighthearted way that our kids um, keep us humble and learn and teach us how to have some thick skin, right? Um, But again, I wanna honor some people in this room. And before I do, As it's been mentioned throughout the service, holidays like today can sometimes do the opposite of what they were really originally intended to do, right? I mean, you have a day like Mother's Day, and and we've already shared um, in the service that someday, sometimes a day like this can be hard. And if you're in this room this morning and you're wrestling with grief, I just wanna take a moment (laughs) and acknowledge you. And, And your grief may be public, or it may be private. I know it's already been shared that there are some in this room who have lost mothers. There are some in this room who have battled with child loss or infertility. There are some in this room who are navigating painful relationships, or maybe motherhood or life just has not looked the way that we had planned. This morning, our hope is that, one, you would have permission to feel whatever you feel today, but that God would meet you with his grace and with his comfort, and that we would be reminded that he is constantly working on our behalf to mend, restore, and heal our hearts. And this morning, I do wanna honor the mothers and the grandmothers and the mother figures in this room. Thank you so much for how you have loved and supported and cared for those that are your children in your life and how much it means to all of us that Day in and day out, you love in a way that really only a mother can understand, right? And I just wanna honor you this morning. And to the aunties and sisters and teachers and mentors and friends that have become family, these are the women in our life that have poured their hearts out into the next generation as if they were their own. Thank you, we need you. Thank you for how you've stepped in and cared for our children. We celebrate and we honor you. And so again, wherever you find yourself on, 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 in this variety of, of the emotions that, that, that come up on Mother's Day, again, our hope and our prayer is that you would be reminded that God sees you, he cares, and he's at work at working all things together for the good of those who love him, amen? Amen. So this morning, um, I've actually asked myself this week, you know, how how predictable do I wanna be on Mother's Day? Do I wanna share about a woman in the Bible or do I wanna mix it up a little bit? And I thought, I'll mix it up just a little bit and I'll share about two women (laughs) in the Bible. So this morning, we're gonna be in the book of Ruth. And um, the book of Ruth we see God take a series of very unfortunate events. And we see God move behind the scenes and bring something beautiful from some pretty difficult situations. And so I wanna give a little bit of background in the book of Ruth before we jump into the scripture. And what we see here is we see a family that's struggling to survive during a famine in Bethlehem. 
all right? The resources um, are fading away. There's, there's no food and people are starting to panic. It's kind of like that one time when there was no toilet paper in Walmart. <laughs> maybe, okay, <laughs> maybe just a little bit more intense than that, okay? But, but they were struggling to survive. And so this family, they're, they're like, okay, well, let's, let's go to another place. And so they decide to move to a country called Moab. And this country was historically an enemy of Israel. And so this just shows the, the state of desperation that this family found themselves in. And so they're willing to go move from home to a place where they may be seen as enemies, but yet they go in hopes of survival. And so this family goes, this mother, this father, and two sons. And when they arrive to Moab, we don't know what happened and what caused this, but their father lost his life. And so you can imagine this family, they've already taken this journey and it was probably in itself just a a big shock to their system, but to lose their father, they're in a place of grief. But they decide to stay and continue to build their home and their life. And eventually, their t- her two sons end up getting married, and they marry these two Moabite women, and they again start to build their life. And the scripture says that 10 years later, both sons also lose their life. And you have this mother, her name is Naomi. This mother and this woman who is now widowed finds herself not only in a place of survival, but now she has found herself in a place of utter grief. And she's there, and she's there with these two daughters-in-law that she probably, quite frankly, does not have very much in common with, but yet she finds herself here. And then she hears word that, okay, the famine has lifted in Israel, and she realizes, I have no reason to stay in Moab anymore. And so she packs up her things and she gets ready to go on this trip and her, daughters, or her daughter in, daughters-in-law join her and as they start this journey, she stops and she realizes, wait a minute, you guys are about to come and become widows and foreigners in a place and from her experience, she's, she's saying, this is no joke. Why, why would you guys come with me? And they begin this dialogue as she tries to persuade them to stay. And so this is where we're gonna pick up in the dialogue this morning. And so if you will, if you are willing and if you are able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? So in Ruth chapter one, verses eight through 18, it says this. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's home, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me, and may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you want to wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. There are far more, things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together. And Orpah, one of the daughters, kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Now may God add his blessing to our reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, if that wasn't a heated argument between a daughter and a mother figure, I don't know what is. 
I mean, you see the tears, you see the sarcasm, you see the drama, you got the threats. I mean, it's all here. And Orpa, the first daughter-in-law, she ended up leaving. And I don't fault her for that. She was simply receiving the wisdom that she had received from her elder, right? She, she, it says that she wept. This wasn't an easy decision for her to make, but in that moment, she made the right hard decision that she felt was right for her. And then there's Ruth. And some of us would say, you know, Ruth was being extremely holy here and she was being led by God. I mean, we see that phrase, wherever you go, I will go, your gods will be my God. We've seen that scripture as just this image of loyalty and commitment. But in this moment, I just, I just imagine that's not exactly how Naomi would have viewed it. I imagine Naomi rolling her eyes and thinking, oh, you were always the stubborn one. I imagine Naomi being like, oh, the hard-headed daughter-in-law, right? And so she's in this moment where, I mean, if you think about it, guys, Ruth is literally making an oath to God so that she can win the argument. You know, like, how can Naomi fight against that? Okay, fine, you can come with me. And so I read this portion of scripture to lay this foundation of this narrative because many of us know the rest of the story. Right, and just a, a glimpse is Naomi and, and Ruth, they go back to Israel and God ends up providing for them over and above what they could have ever imagined. But before we go to the happily ever after part of the story, I wanna, I wanna just spend some time seeing how God uses this unique relationship to bring about this full circle restoration. Because to me, one of the most redemptive parts of this story isn't just the end of the story. It's that Ruth in her own brokenness, Ruth in her own grief of losing a spouse was willing to extend herself for this woman and, and put her own future at risk for the sake of love. And she was doing it to a person who was saying, I have nothing to offer you. Why are you staying with me? I have nothing to give you. If anything, you are just risking your life coming. But this was a love without expectation. This was a love being extended without any strings attached. This was saying, I'm gonna do this and you owe me nothing in return. But let's be real here. Ruth, in this current space they find themselves in in the scripture, Ruth, as a young, now widowed woman, probably felt the same way. Like, I'm gonna come with you, but I actually don't have much to offer you either. And they may be in this moment both seeing each other as somewhat of a burden, but yet they're saying the only thing that I have to give you is my presence. And in this moment, that's all that they needed. I was 11 years old when my family hopped on a plane to visit Iran for the first time. My family, I, I was 11 years old, and my family, we had all planned this big family reunion where my uncles from the States were bringing my cousins, and we were finally able to go and meet all the family that I had never met before and see where my dad was raised, and, and it was just this exciting time for our family. And I remember we got on a plane, and we flew overseas, and we got there, and I got to meet my first cousins. I got to meet uncles and aunts. I got to meet my grandparents for the very first time. And, and I, I don't know if some of you can relate to this, but growing up, um, everybody was kind of an auntie and an, an uncle, so still to this day, I don't really know who I was actually related to or not, <laughs> but you know, it was an amazing time and it was an amazing trip. And my brother and sister, they were older than me, so they, they probably have a much better memory than I do of the time that we spent there, but there's some memories that I hold on to really tightly. And one in particular, was one, one time we, we hopped around from different houses of where we were staying and, and there was one day where we were staying at my grandfather's house. And for those of you who don't know, my grandfather, his name was Aziz, he did not speak a word of English. And here's this little American girl coming over and I did not speak a word of Farsi. Maybe a word, but. Mm. And I remember this one morning I woke up and I walked into his kitchen area, and he was sitting down, 
drinking hot tea and eating a small breakfast of some cheeses, some nuts, and a thin bread, kind of like a pita bread. And I sat down next to him, and he pushed over some food toward me, and we smiled. And we sat there. Every now and then, glancing at one another, smiling and reassuring that we're enjoying this moment. (laughs) And that was it. He didn't rush this moment to leave. I didn't care that we had never carried a conversation. That was my grandfather. And he was with me. And I was with him. And no one could take that moment from me. You know, we're, we're so quick to discount what we have to offer one another. We don't engage when someone's in a crisis because we're afraid we won't have the right words to say. We don't extend in a loving action because we're afraid that our act isn't gonna be the perfect act of love. But why not meet others the way that God himself meets us? With his presence. And is God's presence not one of the most wonderful, beautiful gifts that he has given us? Because when we show up for someone who is hurting, we remind them that they're not a burden in their struggle. And being present is really a gift that God has given us and a gift that we can give other people. So eventually, Naomi and Ruth, they make it back to Israel, and they get there, and the entire town is excited to see Naomi. I mean, they they hadn't seen her in years, and maybe they just didn't know if they would ever get to see her again. And so they welcome her, and they greet her, and Naomi gives a pretty unfiltered response. And so... I just wanted to pick up this interaction in Ruth chapter one, verse 19 through 22, and I want us to see how, how Naomi responds to these welcoming, cheerful um, people that are excited to see her. And they, it says this, so the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi, the women asked? Don't call me Naomi. She responded, instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? Now, let's just say that Naomi kept it real. (laughs) She kept it real. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded that we are not sinning when we are expressing our frustration, when we're expressing our anger, when we're expressing our heartache. I think God would rather us be honest in our frustrations than faking our joy, right? Because I think it's so easy for us to do that. But whenever we expose our pain to others, when we expose our pain outward, Others can now hear and see where we're at and come alongside us. God can begin to heal us. But if we stay hidden behind a smile, we suffer alone. And she was so angry and she was so hopeless in this moment, so hopeless that she literally renames herself from Naomi, which means pleasant, Tamara, meaning bitter. Her spirit is so low that she now has allowed her circumstances to define her identity. This bitter thing that has happened to me has made me bitter. Has anybody ever been there? Where we actually become what has happened to us? You know, grief does some strange things to us. But here's the good news. Our story does not have to end there. 
Our story doesn't have to end there because our grief does not stop God from intervening. It does not stop God from pursuing us. Our anger, even toward God, even when we get angry toward God, does not push him away. He can handle it. He can handle it. And I honestly think that our, our expression of anger toward God can actually be an avenue to our healing with God. A few years back, I was speaking to a mentor in South Africa, and she became this beautiful, safe place for me to process life and some hard things I was going through. And she did this beautiful job of helping me. When, when, when my grief was trying to distort my view of God and myself, because that's what grief does to us, she always helped to put me back to who God truly was and his character. And there was one day where I was talking to her and I was like, I don't know, I've just never really expressed anger to God, like to, directed to him. I mean, I've been angry at people and I've been angry at myself. I've been angry at the devil. I've been angry at circumstances. But expressing anger to God feels a little like, I don't know, crazy. He created us. But in that moment, I knew that's what I was needing to process. And she looked at me and she said, um, she said, Afsana, she said, if Nora, my daughter, if Nora was angry with you, no matter how irrational it was, would you want her to bring herself and that anger toward you to you? Or would you want her to suppress it and hide it from you? I said, well, of, of course I'd want her to come to me. And she said, and God, in his nurture and kindness and love, wants to have that same intimacy and safety with you. He can handle it. And you better believe that that night I poured out and, and cried out the most angry cry I had ever cried out to God. And let, I, I, I let him have it. <laughs> And did my circumstances change overnight? No. But I started to. Now, everything within me didn't change. Everything within me didn't become perfect. But it, became a, a, it began a journey within my walk with God of healing, of newness, and of hope. Are we willing to take it to the Lord? Are we willing to see prayer and our communication with God as not just a way to change the world and to change other people, but a way for it to change us? Amen. And a way for it to be a, a place where we can work on this internal transformative healing. And so once we become healed, we can go out and be a healing agent to the world around us? What if we viewed prayer as a way for us to be healed so that we can help to heal the world? Are we willing to be real with our anger and take it to God? Um, oh, I lost it. Um, and then finally, God will work it out. We can't have a Sunday message about Ruth and not talk about how God actually showed up. Right, because God doesn't leave us in our anger. He doesn't leave us in our pain. He doesn't leave us in our brokenness. He journeys, he jumps in with us and he journeys with us. God is always at work to restore what has been broken. Do we believe that this morning, church? So many times we become so comfortable with our brokenness that we just figure this is just a part of who I am. We allow it to become identity like Naomi did. And we say, this is just a part of what I'm going to walk with. But if we allow God to come in and to men, yes, it's still a part of our story, but it's not who we are. Amen. So the book of Ruth is interesting in that it's one of the books in the Bible, Bible where God is actually barely even mentioned, right? Instead, we see these subtle references of God moving behind the scenes, 
of God actually moving in the lives of this beautiful relationship between daughter and mother figure, right? And actually in their acts, in their decisions, their personal choices to love one another, God shows up. And I think that's so interesting that when we choose to love one another with a love that is unconditional, that's a place where miracles show up. That's where God moves. We don't have to wait for God to tell us to love somebody. We don't have to wait for God to tell us to be bold in how we love other people. We do it and we wait for God to show up. And so as they start to settle into their new lives, Naomi gives Ruth some wisdom in navigating her new work life and navigating a new relationship. Um, Basically, she gives uh, Ruth a play-by-play on how to find what the scripture calls her um, kinsman redeemer. You're like, what does that even mean? So in the scripture, um, in the Jewish law, a kinsman redeemer was a distant, distant, distant relative that took on the responsibility to pay off the debts and to marry a woman who had been widowed. So basically what Naomi does is she becomes a strategic matchmaker utilizing the Jewish law to hook up her, her daughter-in-law. I mean, it's, it's quite brilliant. And it's a beautiful story to watch and to see it unfold. And the story does end with Ruth getting married to an amazing man and having a child after what could have been 10 years of infertility. We don't know if that's exactly how long she was with her husband, but we know they were there in Moab for at least 10 years. And she has this child, and and, and this story ends with Naomi embracing this newborn baby boy. And this is the scripture that that closes the book of Ruth, and I think it's really beautiful. It says this in chapter four, verse 14. It says, then the women of the town said to Naomi, and this was a her embracing this new child. It says, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Amen. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast and she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor woman said, now at last Naomi has a son again, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This child became a part of the lineage of Jesus. And I imagine Naomi, as she held that baby, thought, how in the world did I end up here? How in the world did I end up here? I thought my life was over. I thought my life was useless. I thought I would have nothing to add. Yet God uses her as the person to bring about restoration and a rebuilding to her family. You know, the longer we walk with God, the more we get to see his faithfulness come, tr- come through. Amen. And that's why it's so beautiful and so important to me to surround myself around people who have faith stories of God showing up in the midnight hour. And that's why it's so important for us to share our stories and be reminded that, guess what? You're going through something really difficult. You feel like your life is over. You feel like you have no purpose. But guess what? God will show up. Maybe you are in a transition in your life where maybe you're not as young as you used to be. And you're thinking, okay, wow, there are people that are now looking to me as a model, as someone who could extend wisdom, as someone who could mother or father. And that transition can be a little awkward at times and a little strange, But if you have lived through something and you have seen God come through, 
you have a story to tell. And if you are in the midst of walking through something right now, and it's hard, and you're barely getting up just to make it through the day, but you are, you have a story to tell. Don't keep the goodness of God to yourself. Share the testimony of God to others. Share it with a friend. Share it with a daughter. Share it with a son. Share it with a mentee. Share it so that we can be reminded that even when we don't see God moving, even when we don't see it, Naomi, Ruth, they didn't see it, but God was moving behind the scenes. And now Naomi carried a full circle story of redemption, literally in her hands. And that moment came full circle when she held that baby. A baby not born from her own son and not even born from her own birth daughter. But she held him as if he was her own. And she was now this child's adoptive grandmother, if you will. And through this, God mended her wounded heart. And through this story, we see a picture of God's redemption of love for all of humanity. In Ephesians 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. It says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. What a God we serve. A God that's in the business of placing us in families, a God that's in the business of moving behind the scenes, and a God that's in the business of mending our wounded hearts. This morning, again, wherever you find yourself, maybe you're in the midst of walking something really challenging, maybe you're wondering, Where are you, God? Let us trust that even when we don't see it, even when we don't know it, God is at work on our behalf to restore all things for the good. Do we trust him this morning? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Spirit, God, we thank you, Lord, that you see us this morning, you know us, and you care. Thank you, Holy Spirit, I thank you, God, that in our broken moments, in our moments where we want to become the things that have happened to us, when grief can, can cloud our view of ourselves and even of you, Holy Spirit, remind us of who you are. I thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you are the comforter. And even if that's all we need in the moment, God, your presence is truly enough for us. God, give us the courage to trust you. Give us the courage to love even in our own brokenness. And God, give us the courage one day at a time saying yes to you, God. Thank you for adopting all of us into your family and for giving us all a purpose. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.